Welcome, good morning, everybody. Uh, this event is part of Freelance Futures, a summer program of learning and action for equitable conditions in culture. Um, it's been delivered in partnership with the Freelance Futures Consortia. Uh, my name is Jody, uh, sign name Jody, and I am a uh, five foot tall white woman with long strawberry blonde hair. Um, I'm wearing all black and I've got green beads on um, and I walk with a little bit of a wobble and a wink as well. Um, I would just uh, invite delegates who are here today, welcome everyone, um, just to sign your name in the chat um, and just any comments around who you are as well um, would be good, a bit of context. Um, and if you can please remain on mute um, unless you are obviously contributing verbally. And before we start, we just need to outline some access and other important information. So first of all, this session is being recorded and will be permanently available to view via our dedicated YouTube channel or via the website or community platform. Uh, captioning, we have uh, my clear text providing live captioning today. To access this, please just click the CC closed caption button. Um, it's possible to access this in a full, uh, full transcript as well or on screen as captions, whatever you prefer. Just taking a little bit of a pause so everyone can get that in place. Uh, we have um, Rachel Jones providing BSL today from the Interpreters of Colour Network. Um, and yes. Just make sure that she is pinned. She is great. Um, freelance Futures is a call for collective learning and action to build equitable conditions for freelancers working in culture. And it will take all our efforts to affect real change. So we welcome all your insights and experiences as independent practitioners and practitioners working within cultural organisations, unions, funding bodies, and in policy making. Given that, we do need all of us um, to just follow a basic code of conduct for today. So please do respect and value your collaboration in this room um, and your collaborators, sorry, um, and be aware of your privilege and know when to make space and when to take space. Uh, please avoid any overcomplicated language, jargon and, expect, uh, and explain any technical terms. Um, and just be appreciative that we are all at different stages of learning. So just respecting the person and challenge the idea. Uh, this is a relaxed environment. So feel free to access this event in any way that makes participating work for you. Um, and it's possible, please start with your um, video switched on to welcome our speakers and contributors. In participating in the meeting, if you have a question or point to raise today, use the raised hand function in the reaction tool or type the word question in the chat function and we will hopefully have time to come to you. Um, we will be using the chat function to help us with enabling some of the discussion today and ask that it's used for that rather than for side conversations, please. Uh, we hope that this will assist in providing um, access and inclusion and discussions for everyone at this event. Uh, so that is all the housekeeping out of the way. Um, so I would just like to uh, very warmly uh, welcome our panellists for today. We have uh, Tan Sindon, who is the consultant and facilitator at Museum Detox. Uh, Tan, could you just give an audio description of yourself, please? Hi, yes. Um, so I'm an independent consultant and facilitator and coach. Um, and I also was involved and um, is involved as a member of Museum Detox, um, which I'll talk more about, I'm sure, as we, as we go on. Um, I am a Southeast Asian woman um, and I have long black hair. I'm in a um, khaki uh, dress um, or olive green a dress this morning, and um, I'm uh, I have some freckles. I don't know if you can see them across the screen. So that's uh, that's me. Thank you, Tan. We're also joined by Jenna Almachenko, 
who is the Touring and Partnerships Manager at National Theatre. Welcome, Jenna. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, I'm Jenna. I work at the National Theatre. I um, look after quite a lot of our national work um, across the country. I am a five foot eight white woman with um, dark brown shoulder length hair, and I am wearing a white and black striped top this morning. Thank you. And we are also joined by Johnny Cotson, who is an artist and consultant. Johnny, if you could just give an uh, AD of yourself, please. Hi, Jody. Um, uh, so I'm Johnny. I'm an artist and a creative actor consultant. My pronouns are uh, he and him. Uh, I am wearing a, um, a blue fisherman hat with uh, on top of my head um, and I have a clear uh, glatted. Um, I have a black t-shirt with gold writing on it dead um, death vibe. Um, I am uh, five foot five foot ten um, and I'm white, uh, I'm Welsh, uh, I'm Jewish and I'm deaf. Thank you. Um, and so I am the uh, creative learning director at Grey Eye Theatre Company. Um, I've worked there for ooh, 13 years. Um, when you're on a good wicket, you've got to stick with it. Um, I'm also a freelancer um, outside of my, uh, my grey eye realm as well. Um, but just in terms of uh, giving a bit of context to perhaps why I'm here as well, um, grey eye has been going for sort of the last 40 years. And over most recently, we've... Uh, undergone you know incredible learning over the pandemic period just in terms of how we respond to all our freelance network um, we have uh, sort of over 500 freelancers that we're working with each year uh, 250 or over 250 of those freelancers are deaf disabled neurodivergent artists and we have really um, you know opened our ears and and opened our eyes to what um, artists need through this period um, and it's given us great learning in terms of um, how we may uh, sort of uh, democratize leadership um, and uh, create more equality across the leadership of our programs um, it has also um, you know uh, instigated the uh, us co-founding the we shall not be removed movement um, of disability arts organizations and artists of how we influence change and policy um, around the emergency response to the pandemic um, and we have also been looking at how we've been able to um, uh, listen to artists in terms of what they need right now and how we can facilitate that in terms of funding or in terms of um, putting extra access in place for online events that freelancers may be, um, uh, you know, not being able to access usually. Um, and the learning continues absolutely for us. Um, and I think it's really important to say that Grey Eye is a learning organisation um, because we never stop learning and we never stop listening and uh, finding out from our artists, from our freelance network who, let's face it, hold us up um, of how we can continue to make sure that things are equitable and equal across the board and continue to influence that change. So uh, today we're going to hear from Tan, Jenna and Johnny um, about change and about how we influence change, how we maybe have um, implemented uh, different ways of uh, creating change and also how we kind of look forward to um, how others, how we can kind of empower others, maybe who don't feel like they can make change to be able to kind of make those steps forward. Um, so this is going to be a little bit of um, us uh, sharing about what we have done or what we are doing, but also kind of a real call to action towards the end around um, what we can all be doing um, to make things more equitable and equal. Um, so I might come to uh, Tan first. Um, Tan, has there been a specific area of change you've been involved in to create access, equality and equitability? And if you can just talk a little bit about that for us. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Jodie. Um, and morning, everyone. Um, I, uh, in the work that I uh, have uh, come to do uh, has been more and more about um, 
creating change and equitable conditions and inclusion in the cultural sector. So as an independent uh, practitioner, uh, consultant, um, coach and facilitator, that's predominantly the work that I, that I do. I do organisational development um, to create a more inclusive workplace and to enable teams to deliver uh, on mission and, and capture value and deliver on value. So um, I've worked with um, different organisations around, around change, but also what I wanted to talk more to, about with you this morning is um, a network uh, called Museum Detox, which is a diverse network for Black, Asian and ethnic diverse museums, heritage and gallery workers. And we are a network of community of belonging and we are also about change. Um, we're about creating a systemic um, cultural change that ensures the um, equitable condition and uh, diverse and representation and fairness of better inclusion for um, diverse uh, Black, Asian and ethnically diverse uh, non-white museum workers. So um, some of the things that we've been involved in doing um, as a network, you know, how it was uh, started, how it was instigated was through um, some, a group of people, um, founding members, um, members, uh, founding members like Sara Wajid, who's now co-CEO of Birmingham Museums Trust, and um, Miranda Lowe, who's principal creator at National History Museum. A group of them came together and just felt that in museums, they weren't, um, seeing the, the progress and the change. It was very much uh, a white workforce, white spaces, and uh, not telling uh, the diverse stories and, and stories of, of, of objects and um, belonging um, that, that needed to be told that was more diverse. So um, topics around decolonization and um, better, you know, treatment and conditions and progress um, in, uh, in particular for uh, people of colour in the sector. And um, that evolved into um, a, a flash mob and a call to action around, you know, we need to do something about this here um, in this space, in, the, in, this, uh, in this sector. Um, and that actually led to building a, a network in the community of people who just felt they were so alone in their institutions um, and their organizations across the country. Um, and suddenly they felt there was um, a, a group and a network of people who understood their experiences, who can share and support um, and, and also look at actually how do we come together to instigate change and to create action? Um, and the joy of actually coming together and having a safe space um, to, to do that. Um, and some of the social events we've had over the years um, have been uh, really fun and really empowering and uplifting. And what we've we seen um, in terms of the change um, that we've made is that actually as a collective voice to say, we, we, we want to see progress, we want to see leadership that is more reflective um, of the diverse um, communities in, in, in the country. Um, and we want to see stories that are told that are reflective of the diverse communities um, in, you know, in, in our cities. Um, and we want better representation and inclusion and understanding of the experiences um, that uh, we go through um, as uh, people of colour working in the sector. Um, and so there was this um, collective kind of voice and championing and campaigns around decolonization, around um, uh, leadership and progress, and also empowering and supporting each other to voice um, systemic um, inequality and discrimination. So, um, the, the one of the lasting legacy around uh, this, uh, you know, these years work is that we have a strong network of over 400 people with different chapters across the country. Um, the committee, who is a voluntary committee, who I chaired um, and uh, is now uh, consolidated um, more into a structure of a community interest uh, um, organization, um, has supported. The, the network members in the sector during the pandemic 
we did fundraising and we provided a um, hardship fund to support um, anyone in the sector, particularly freelancers during that time um, that might need that funding for that short term um, relief. Um, and and to focus on supporting well-being um, during uh, the, the the pandemic as well as the impact on um, our members, um, in particular our black um, members uh, after the George Floyd um, murder. So that's been kind of the the work and the environment that um, I've been involved with in terms of museum detox, and it's 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 mostly been about. Um, change and celebrating each other um, and, and solidarity. Amazing. Thank you, Tan. Um, some incredible work that you're doing there at Museum Detox. Um, that word belonging comes up quite a lot, um, such an important word. Um, Johnny, can I come to you next? And I might just ask you the same question about um, you know, the specific area of change you've been involved in. Um, you may, some of you may have uh, seen Johnny recently um, on the BBC um, or indeed on one of his um, Edinburgh Fringe, I think, as well with your um, autobiographical show, Johnny. But um, can you just talk to us a little bit about your specific area of change that you've been involved in? Yeah, thanks, Jodie. I'm glad you brought up about the BBT because I thought that was something that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, before I talk about the BBT, uh, the reason why I became a freelancer uh, because I was really disappointed about the lack of uh, uh, assets in Wales where I come from and uh, I realised there needed to be a huge change. But I remember years and years ago, I think it was about six years ago when I became a freelancer and I was starting to ask quite a lot of um, deaf advocates uh, or uh, those who um, want to empower change. And a lot of them said, uh, I've talked about my vision, this is what's gonna happen. And a lot of them just said to me, good luck. And I couldn't really understand why they say good luck to me. And these are the guys who've been campaigning since the 80s, you know, the disability rights movement and everything. You know, I'm, I was young, I was fresh, I was ready. And I've realized now why they said good luck, because it becomes a cycle. It's reinventing that cycle. How do we break uh, that cycle? And it's just content, content. But um, I've, I, uh, whenever I've tried to um, make work, it's not about just having the conversation about action. <laughs> so action, do I knew how do I get from uh, I suppose training uh, deaf awareness to five people to. 1.4 million with what this is how many people watch on BBT. Do I have to work out a way of getting from just a simple guy you want to campaign for better at that, but all the way up to the BBT? Do I knew I knew that hmm, what do I do? Right, first of all, I need to make myself more prominent. How do I make myself more prominent? So the, the only way I could do this is to perform. Now, this is a guy you were told I should never act because uh, I'm deaf and uh, la 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 la, you know, I was told they'd never do all of this. So I thought, well, fuck it, I'm doing it. You know, I'm going to do this, you know, uh, because the only way I could get the matter to cross by telling them my story and realise the barriers that we face on a content, on a, on a daily basis. Now, uh, because I've been quite successful with the show, um, but I could talk about it if it comes up again. Um, um, people start to take more aware of how I kind of, um, and I'm very influenced by Grey Eye, how they use the term the aesthetic of asset. So what that means is it not become asset and become an add-on, it becomes interweaved into how you make work and it's beautiful um, and, uh, you know, and uh, it becomes, I hate that word, normalised, because you'll see asset, it's almost invisible, uh, but yet it really appealed to a wider audience. Now, the BBC uh, were really interested in a lot of the work. They wanted to do a documentary uh, about um, about my journey, which would, um, it would, for those who hadn't seen it, called... Um, uh, I've forgotten, uh, Our Lives, um, which is currently on in the moment. I was the first one and called Born, Born, Born Death of Aetherian. Um, So one of the biggest uh, trends I felt at the time, BBC were reluctant to put subtitled on um, on their program because they're saying uh, that people will always just click on the subtitled. But I'm saying, no. That's not the attitude you need to be doing. We need to be more visible here. Um, so um, 
a content, content, almost uh, confrontation I had and realised the importance of what it is. And, uh, and what I've found is that um, I have to lead on it rather than a non-disabled person or a non-deaf person. I have to lead it. I'm the one that has to be saying, this is what you need to be doing, this is how it should be. And um, what what I felt was really important to me is to the subtitle, not just uh, you know for the deaf people, for those um, who simply want to have their have their food and they, and uh, or people are talking around the table and they've got the subtitle there, so it appealed to everyone. But it's really important for me the subtitle play the power of how I hear through my hearing aid in terms of. Um, getting the method across for those who don't know or don't understand what the white noise that I actually hear. So it's very important, it's significant of you to subtitle So in the end, they used subtitled, uh, which were uh, on the document, on the, um, um, on the on the show, and uh, I believe now uh, they are going to be doing it for future programs, um, which is, for me, uh, it's the most significant change that I believe that I could done. And, um, uh, you know, the messages I'll be getting from um, people who've seen the show, these are the people I don't know, people will be saying, uh, thank you for sharing the story with me, um, I could share you my story. And I thought, I've always thought it was just me, or maybe a few others, but they are thousands, 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 thousands of people, and uh, so um, I'm in a crossroads at the moment about how do I respond to that and how it feels to me um, society is a bit broken um, mm. in a way um, uh, and, it's, and it's really a powerful thing. Uh, we've seen it with Joe Wick, Joe Wick but he did something about mental health and now uh, we've seen it with my show and it's incredible uh, because the power of TV or the power of documentary storytelling is really the way to get the message across. So that has been the most significant change for me when it comes to act at. Johnny, I think you've, you've mentioned things that um, it feels like, you know, such simple changes, yet the fight <laughs> to get those done is long and hard. Um, and, and you've uh, sort of demonstrated that as well. That thing around, you know, always having to try and fit into that, to that box and you've completely like opened that up and said, no, if you're working with me, you know, making those demands and um, they're, they're an absolute right. Um, Jenna, can I come to you next? Um, and feel free just to, to talk freely also about um, again, covering some of that, but I'd also um, love to hear from you around um, anything unexpected that's come from some of that change, something that perhaps in, in working towards something, something has kind of gone off on a tangent and you've had this, you know, whether it's positive or negative, um, kind of, uh, yeah, unexpected change. Yeah, maybe um, I can talk a bit about unexpected developments from the, the seeds of change that might be um, quite useful um, or interesting, hopefully. Um, but I guess a bit of background. I've been at the National Theatre for five years now. Um, it feels like a lifetime sometimes because, as you can imagine, change in an organisation of that size is slow. And, and tricky and full of unexpected um, barriers and hurdles. Um, sometimes it feels like the will is there, but the way is unclear. Um, but before that, I've worked in, in, in a lot of smaller organisations across the country and been a freelancer. And yeah, I'm from a, a working class background in North Manchester, where I am right now. Um, and yeah, I guess unexpected I think the thing about being in a massive institution I guess or a massive organization that has a big history is that you it, it's easy to feel very intimidated by that by that the size and by um the history of it and by literally the statues and the paintings that are around you on the walls every day when you walk in um, I guess the thing, my bit of the work that I do is, is lead on a lot of our national work. And I guess what I'm interested in is, um, is, is what a national theatre means wherever you are in the country and how can you fulfil that brief um, and the constant struggles to try and be national theatre for everybody, which is kind of the, almost the unattainable 
end end of all of this work and I feel very kind of you know being a young person whose grandparents are all um, immigrants like we and whose access to kind of culture and the arts wasn't really an option when I was growing up um I feel really really passionate like a 13 year old in a school outside of Sunderland feels like the National Theatre is for them as much as Rufus Norris does um and that is kind of I guess the change that I'm always working towards um um chipping away at that at that institution um I guess an unexpected thing is that when you start for good for good actually when you start to make things more equitable um and when you start to ask that 13 year old in Sunderland what a national theatre should be or even maybe like a teacher in Wakefield or a head teacher in Rochdale or an artist in um in Wigan, when you start opening that conversation and you build that trust and you build that relationship um, over the five years that, that I've been here, the stuff that you hear sometimes is really difficult. And the stuff that, you know, the feedback you get actually is stuff that the organization doesn't want to hear. Um, you know, they think they're, you know, they think they're further on than actually they are, or they think, um, you know, so that that's difficult. It's, it's unexpected, but it's also great. I love, I'm I'm a big fan of never hearing the kind of success stories, but I'll, but hearing what didn't work, hearing where we got it wrong, and hearing where actually things weren't equitable, or where it felt like the national theatre was being very top down, but rather than kind of grassroots up. So I think that the unexpected is that when you start to build that trust and open stuff up, um, and you give people ownership, they they run with it, and that thirteen year old in Sunderland will say things. I mean. We had um, we had a um, I produce a schools tour every year that goes into about seventy schools across the country, um, and we deliberately go into schools where access to theatre and the arts um, is 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 tricky if it exists at all, and we deliberately tour to young people who've never seen live theatre before, and. We did a reading of our last school's tour in a, in a school hall in Wakefield last half term. And the teachers just said, anybody who's free, like young people, if you want to just come along in, in half term, it's completely optional. And 50, 50 young people turned up, which was kind of wild, but brilliant. We were like, what are you all doing in your half term in school? Like, get out of here. Um, but we did a Q&A afterwards that was supposed to be about um, 15 minutes long. It ended up being an hour and a half. And it was with the writer of the play and the company and the director and everybody and, and me and some National Theatre staff. And um, yeah, we, um, yeah, it was an hour and a half. And one of the questions was from a young person, uh, Reese. She said to us, um, you know, you, um, you know, you've come here and you've asked all these questions and it's nice, but actually, do you really care? Like, do you really care? You know, are you ticking a box listening to young people or, or what are you going to do with this? And then about five minutes later, she said, you know, you, you know, you grown ups have basically ruined the world and it's all your fault. You need to give over the power to us now because, you know, you've screwed it, basically. And um, it was brilliant. It was amazing. And that's why it went on for an hour and a half, because actually the conversations were fantastic. But that that conversation with that young person in that room has now shaped the next bit of our programme for the next 18 months. So I think the challenging thing is having a young person tell you <laughs> that you're just ticking a box or that you've ruined the world. But the, the brilliant thing is then you can, you can, if you're listening properly, I think you can then completely respond. And our next piece of work um, for schools training, we're devising with young people across the country. We were in a school in Sunderland yesterday, um, yeah, doing that devising work. So, um, and, and really kind of giving that voice away. So it isn't coming from the NC, it's coming from young people across the country. So yeah, I think the surprising thing is sometimes hearing stuff that you don't wanna hear, but the best thing about that is then you can react and reflect and make the change. And, um, and if you've built up that trust, you can make that change pretty quickly sometimes. Jenny, you, you, um, you made a point that I think uh, lots of heads would be nodding as well in terms of like that uh, influencing that big organization how do you facilitate when uh you know these young people are talking to you about what needs to change how do you facilitate that within the organization is it about starting with your work and then sort of drawing it out or seeing 
you know, is it about colleagues seeing the way things work so much more equitably in the work that you do and want to adopt that? How does that work? I think it's a mixture and I think sometimes I haven't actually nailed it either like I you know knowing myself I am quite stubborn for for um for kind of better and for worse really and you know um so sometimes I I kind of force the change which and then you have to then backtrack and bring everybody along with you and that can be quite tricky so I have I haven't this isn't someone who's an expert I haven't nailed this sometimes it is changed by absolute bloody mindedness um but yeah I think it's also about trust I think it's 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 doing it it's showing how brilliant it is when you do do it so you know the examples of the work and how much richer and more exciting it is I think it's also about having allies as well like in the in the organization who totally buy into it but also outside the organization like across the country you know building a network of artists of teachers, of head teachers, of um, of uh, of young people, um, and of and even within my team as well, like building, you know, when we're recruiting a new team, building that team, so it feels so people are, are bought into that mission already. So then you're even if it feels exhausting sometimes shouting at an organization and I shouldn't say that because you know it's not about it's not about a lack of will it's or care it's just a it's a big organization thing but I think it's the it's when when it feels exhausting you can go and speak to a drama teacher in Wakefield and have that conversation or go and speak to an artist in in Rochdale and have that conversation and it, and topping up your level so you can go again um but yeah demonstrating I think the work and, and how brilliant it is um, having that collective voice that isn't just me from internal and out and external from in the organization and um and just but it's, it's belief in it isn't it like it just is better the work is better it's more exciting and I think when you see that uh, the examples of it it's hard not to believe in it mm, yeah absolutely and I think, um, you know, given that we all on the panel here have had, um, you know, some of us are already freelancers or kind of um, that's in our experience and too, in our careers, has there been conditions or environments um, in which you've thrived in and maybe as a consideration for organisations um, to adopt? Johnny, you've already talked a little bit about that process you went through with the BBC around implementing implementing um, captions as something that's already embedded rather than add-on. Um, but what are some of the conditions, and this is open to, to all three of you, what are some of the conditions that you've thrived in that might be a consideration for organisations? Tan, I'll come to you first. Um, I, I, I thrived in conditions where actually, you know, we come to we come to working together as equal partners. And I think that in terms of um, and we're collaborating. And I think that organizations and institutions, when commissioning work um, to um, you know, to to freelancers, to independent consultants, the power balance is um, something to be aware of because actually if you um, yes there is a piece of work that needs to be done and there is a a transactional element to this however you know when we're looking at change and we're looking at developing equitable conditions and inclusion um, we need to do that very much from the ethos of the collaboration from the start of working with um, uh, with uh, our, our freelancers and so for me um, when uh, that approach um, and that kind of um, uh, you know sort of working ethos is there that sort of uh, meeting of you know actually we're we're equal partners and we're working to solve something together and we've got a goal and we're trusted you know um, there's trust built there there's clear terms of agreement um, there's re- there's kind of very well um, it, it, you know it's, it's it's well paid and it's well resourced in terms of the support that you get um, that it's not a piece of work that's outsourced and that's it you deal with everything you deal with every, you know there's no kind of like um, coming back to and working together so it's very you know very much collaborative 
um, let's work this out together because some things are going to need to see how they land and what's the next best step to take, um, especially when you're instigating change and doing change development. So I think that in an environment where actually um, organisations come and work with freelancers uh, and um, you know consultants with um, the understanding of that power dynamic and um, with that kind of uh, you know equitable collaborative ethos in mind that's when for me I best uh, work and collaborate with. And yeah that that idea of bringing in um, artists that you are planning to work with much earlier in the process I know that's something that um, at Grey Eye, we've um, really kind of ramped up. Um, it's sort of like even like once the funding is there and it being a very open brief rather than a freelancer coming in later in the stage and responding to a brief, which can potentially limit creativity and, and, um, and, and maybe not so flexible. Um, so I know that's something that we've taken away as well. Um, Johnny, what about it sort of further to what you've already talked about? Um, those conditions in which make it uh, some uh, an, an environment in which you can thrive in. Um, yeah, I think um, I think one of the most important conditions for me um, would be what we call at that rider. Um, I think for those of you who don't know what the at that rider is, if you if you are willing and you should work with the deaf or disabled new divergent in your organisation, you provide something what we call an act that rider. An act that rider is very simple. Uh, it could be uh, a document or whatever, how you how they feel comfortable, it to provide the need in order to create a safe environment where they could thrive and they could flourish and they could create the best work. So for example, um, you know, um, my act that rider would be uh, have uh, an interpreter, um, and have a note taker, but it also can mean more. I like to have time out um, uh, for reading because it, I, I could suffer from fatigue from not only speaking, styling, lip reading, hearing, movement, moving, all of those things. So when you have an at right, at that rider in plate, um, so it, it then you feel the the organization or the employer will feel very comfortable once you knowing that that the at that need they, they want. And uh, for me that one of the uh, thing I always attract to other employers when working with uh artists um and um uh, I did it for the BBT and uh, then for many other organization and everything has been there in place for me so um so it creates that kind of safe environment and for me it's really important once you have a safe environment you start to trust each other and once you've got trust you could thrive and you could start to collaborate and and uh, really create fantastic work and uh, so they are so that is uh, probably the uh uh, most uh, important uh, condition for me anyway. Uh, I hope that answered the question. It does indeed. And I think someone's also added um, how to create an access rider, um, which is Vijay Patel's um, guidance to that as well. Um, there is a question uh, from Jess White as well. Um, from a practical point of view, do you give your access rider ahead of sorry, uh, give your access rider ahead of in doing any work um, and do you have a conversation with the employer? Well, I now um, start to put it in my email signature. So, um, so one, and so I, they could see it every time. So I haven't, I've, at the moment, uh, I've got a simple line, but what I've done, I need to upload it. I've done a video. I've done a, a, a four minute four minute video just talking, I'm signing, I'm just capturing, and I'm gonna put it in my email signature. I think um, I got this idea from uh, a new working with a newer divergent artist, and she put her asset writer in the um, in the email signature because they because they constantly always see it. So um, so yeah, I would um, I always uh, if I'm going for working with somebody, here's my art advisor. If you're going to work with a uh, artist, uh, just provide it in, uh, in the um, in, in the email or whatever, how you're doing it. And then it's optional whether they want to do it or not. And I think um, I was talking to uh, Richard Watts um, when we were uh, planning today's event as well. Um, and Richard said a really interesting thing that I've never forgotten, which, um, because I think at Grey Eye as well, we get a lot of uh, people going, yeah, but how much does that cost? 
you know, how much do things cost rather than thinking about it as like an embedded thing that access is, is embedded in what we do and is needed and it's not optional. Um, and I remember Richard saying, you know, it's a story that we tell um, in organisations of how we justify um, our actions and I think that's really stayed with me. And I think we all do it. I know at, at Grey Eye, there's, there was definitely, you know, a narrative that we pull around uh, why we're doing a certain thing, um, not compromising access in any way. Um, but it's such an interesting thing. So if you are, I suppose, um, if you do have an access rider, um, I think it's really important to be quite um forward with that and feel really confident that this is a right that you have um but also just acknowledging that it's yeah sometimes it, it is difficult because people think well uh are they going to employ me or not uh, knowing that sharing your access requirements and then not getting the job for that reason is uh actually discrimination so just remembering that um jenna was there anything you wanted to add around that and in, in terms of for you what works um I guess, I mean, echoing what Johnny said then really about trust, trust for me is the biggest thing. It's, it's, you know, we quite, we quite often have conversations at being of projects and say, you know, we're working on this for a long time together and let's, you know, it's been, we need to have a really, you know, brilliant relationship and, um, and a lot of trust because then, you know, if, if we do as an organization, I mean, as an individual get something wrong it's a really easy conversation to say, actually, can you be better at this in whatever that thing is? Or if anything gets tricky, because, you know, projects are complex, especially in, um, in you know, during and post COVID times, things can get, people have got fatigue, there's been trauma. So, you know, all of that, I guess, contributes to, to who we are as kind of fully rounded people. Um, and bringing your kind of whole self into a situation or as much as you want to, that stuff is going to impact. So I guess, yeah, I, my thing is always build those really good, long lasting relationships so that at any point in the process, you can have that trust and that openness. And you can say, actually, that when you did that or when this happened or last week, that wasn't great. Um, and I, that for me is a, is a space where everybody can thrive because it's so needed. And I guess from a big organisation point of view, it's really practical. But take the admin, take all the admin, like make make life as easy for your freelancers as possible. Like book their travel, book their accommodation, pay their invoices fast, like make life as easy as possible so that um, you're not asking the person who isn't in a fully funded role or a full time role in an organisation to do any more work than is necessary or to have any more stress on them than is necessary. That for me feels absolutely vital. Mm. Yeah. Great point. Um, and I guess, for, for again, just opening up this up to all of us. Um, has there been a shift? Are we are we feeling that there is a shift in that in that power balance? Um, and, and where are we seeing that? Tan, did you want to talk? Yeah. About so, I think that we, um, um, I think we le we've we've we're learning and we learn from and we build on and we kind of you know collaborate and there's momentum. So, I think across the board, it, there's. There's, there's, there's a whole spectrum of, you know, good practice as well as what this is still still something that has to be asked for. So, um, that, you know, there is stuff, definitely everyone on different pages um, and and um, it's not all there in terms of, you know, the, the, the best practice or the better practice. Um, but in terms of um, organising, mobilising and voicing um, our work, I, you know, I like, for example, Freelance Futures, I would really like to see, you know, what impact this is this is making for freelancers at the, you know, at the end of this program, um, and and having something like Museum Detox as a network, I know that it has made a difference to the individual members that have come um, on board um, and uh, and and become a member have felt more empowered um, to uh, speak uh, for themselves, to speak and to create change, um, to advocate for others. Um, and 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 I think that 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 sort of collective uh, effort, collective endeavour, has certainly um, uh, I've seen that been 
holding organizations to account more and more so and there's there's you know there's more room and space to listen jenna or johnny did you want to add to that uh, um very briefly, um, I think there had been a, a little change. We definitely did uh, coming from uh, a deaf creative. We've seen a lot of um, deaf creative at the front, um, art in like could be on the TV, on the theatre, um, but I feel it's not quite there behind the scenes. So we're talking about deaf directed, deaf writer, deaf producer, um, uh, deaf person of colour, um, all of those things, I feel that way it's lacking. Um, for me, I think I think there need to be more um, in terms of equal, um, um, equal terms where how do we work with deaf creative in terms of getting to the top? I feel like they had uh, a very good power shift in the middle doctor, in the middle area, but it's not quite there in terms of reaching to the top. Um, uh, I hope to make that change, uh, particularly in Wales. Uh, it's a project I'm working on at the moment, trying to integrate that change um, because I don't really want to be, yeah, but I'm really grateful. I appreciate that we have fantastic deaf creative on 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 the twin but uh, in order for, in order to to, uh, to create work that feels authentic we need writers we need uh, facilitated we need uh, more consultants we need producers or, or uh, so i feel like it, it it's there but um uh, um you know i think it's slowly getting up there that's what i think more work to be done well on that note then um, just thinking about some really kind of tangible things that we can be moving forward with. Um, and Jenna, I might come to you first, if that's okay. Um, you know, what do we all need to do and uh, be aware of or communicate to make this decision-making more inclusive and equitable and, and, and equal? Um, I think trans transparency um, really, when I think about um, um, even being in an organisation, I think some people love hierarchy and some people love holding on to that power, actually. Um, part of me thinks what Johnny was saying about um, ch some change is happening, but it's the, it's, the, it's the kind of the middle level and it's not there yet. I think part of me thinks, unfortunately, it's time. <laughs> It's wait, it's waiting. I think the, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing I keep hearing from kind of younger artists is when we share experiences of the shitty things that have happened to us as freelancers, um, yeah, you know, as, as kind of younger artists or producers in the industry, the, the thing that I hear a lot is, but we'll never do that. We'll never do that. Like we'll we'll never go into we'll never treat people the way we were treated or or kind of no, no matter how much power we get or however high we get in that kind of hierarchy that was talking about if we get to the top we won't replicate those behaviors so it, it's not a practical thing necessarily to do but I think time I think there are people who I'm so kind of inspired by the people I I work with kind of who I see around me who are, who are climbing up and who are getting. To um, yeah, because I just think actually, there is some big change happening there. And if we all kind of, a waiting game isn't really fun, is it? But also I think, it, you know, it's coming, it's coming slowly. Anne, can I come to you? Um, so I, I, I agree with Jenna in terms of like transparency. I think I think knowledge is power, isn't it? So knowing, um, uh, knowing, uh, uh, and having access to knowledge and to to what's what's happening, um, and being able to. So, so I think like um, the sharing of that a lot more open source, open sharing, um, and I think that across networks um, we can do that as well as organisations and institutions being more. Um, transparent and sharing more of that information and, and decision making to make it more inclusive. I think that in terms of, um, you know, like it's both, it's both ways that they, that organizations need to um, 
you know, have that have a more participatory roots um, into um, be more democratic in terms of their decision making and involving more and more voices um, to 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 um, both uh, give insight as well as influence um, what needs to be changed. Um, and and also for our, for us um, as individuals as collectives um, to advocate for that space to be made um, and to take that space. Thank you. And there's a, a question from uh, Jess White. Um, uh, how do large organisations though do what you're saying, uh, Tan? Is that led by the director uh, or by the governance? I think leadership is definitely that you know the change um, being um, committed in leadership and um, accountable in leadership uh, really would make a difference in terms of that fast, you know, faster, more progress being made. Um, and and who holds the governance and the leadership to account? Um, I guess that's you know like a responsibility that we can all take on. Um, uh, and and yeah, I, I, I you know it, the change can be change can happen any way. Anyone in the organisation can create make change. And I think for that, you know, not you know not, not to have that, that slow burn of change, we need we need the leadership. We need people in positions that are committed to to do that. And I would just uh, invite our delegates, if you had um, any questions, now would be the time to uh, post them. We might have a couple of minutes to get to those. Um, what, and kind of, Jenna, you uh, touched on this earlier uh, in your uh, introduction around, you know, there's, there's so many people who um, feel like they don't have that power to make the change as freelancers. Um, me, myself, in Grey Eye, I'm the Creative Learning Director. I feel like I, I have that privilege of being able to say if, if someone comes to me with um, needing to change something, I, they don't, I don't need to go to someone else and ask for that to happen. I just, it, it just happens um, because of the position I'm in and, and I take that responsibility incredibly seriously um, and we have to listen even harder um, around that. Um, so what, what about for, for some, some of us who perhaps don't, yeah, don't feel that power to make a change. Now, listening to all of this and going, okay, yeah, cool, I know I have to do that, but like, how, how, how do I get to that position to feel like I can say something? Um, what, what's some advice from some of you around around that? How do we, um, yeah, how do we support those to feel like they can make a change? Um, can I just uh, jump in here first, Jodie? Yeah. Okay, um, I do it through my practice and I think that through all of our practice that we've been speaking to uh, this morning on the panel um, is that, you know, we're, we're in this uh, the space of um, uh, somebody actually in the chat mentioned about values and being values led and actually in a, an organization or a working um, situation where, you know, those 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 um, Values are not upheld. Um, you know the the practice is not supported to be equitable um, and diverse. Um, is something that we 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 need to kind of work with and call out and and support. Um, I call in. I think uh, sometimes is very appropriate as well because it's about making progress together. Um, and um, so yeah, I, I think that that as as individuals in our own practice. We can we can do that, um, and as organisations um, and people in organisations, it's very much you know like you say, Jody, leadership being kind of really advocating, role modelling, and um, ensuring that's embedded, um, and and looking at how you're doing, you know, kind of actually holding yourself into account with that. Johnny, what would be your you've already demonstrated you know the kind of journey you've been on I suppose and got to that point where you feel like you can actually power change what would be your advice to someone um, who perhaps feels like they can't um I thought that reading the chat I'm quite moved by quite a lot of things we've done in the chat and um it is toxic uh, working in an organization so uh, what I found is that um uh, being a freelancer um, is collaboration 
and um, I've collaborated with Hearin Organization in order for me to take everything off from them and drip feed everything, drain them out, and then chip the power uh, of what I could, what should be doing. And, um, and that's what I feel like I, I've been doing. Um, so working, so for example, um, I would, uh, for example, I worked with a venue who was two minutes away from a deaf club, yet no deaf people ever went to the theatre. So what I did was um, I purposely applied for a job within the venue. I didn't want a job, but I applied for it, got it, it was a tricky job, but I got it. Do I go, hang on, here we go, I'm in. And um, and then I, what I did was I, I drained them. I drained them, absolutely drained them. I, I did everything what I did, what they need to be doing. They had one person, because it was totally them what they were doing. Um, they were putting on a deck of a children, meant nothing. So what I did was um, I just set up something called Deaf Theatre Club. Okay, it didn't mean anything, but the word deaf and theatre, they could connect with it. One person came to my first ever show. By six months, I had 29 people who came to the venue. 28 of them never, ever been to that venue. So what I've done is I've gone in and um, I've gone in and uh, and I really, really, like, top, um, you know, used my experience of what I need to be doing. That's the power I've done. And I've been doing that now with other organisations. I've done it with Art Council and Art Council have done it. And I'm, I'm kind of done it with the BBC. So, you know, it's it about... It's hard, you know, it, it's hard. And I've freelanced um, But sometimes you've got to be brave and bullshit. And uh, some really positive comments coming through um, about that, Johnny. And I think what um, we've exemplified today as well is that um, we can be allies and we are allies and to use this network as well as a real resource if you're feeling disconnected at all. Um, we ha have run out of time, um, but I want to thank all of you. Uh, thank you to Tan, Jenna and Johnny um, for being our wonderful panellists today and um, wishing everyone a lovely rest of your day. Enjoy the sunshine. Summer is here at last. Um, and, uh, yeah, we will hopefully see you again soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to Rachel for providing BSL and thank you to Heather for captioning today as well. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.